professor at the Peking University. He's of course well known to anyone who is interested in Indalistic studies, uh, even though uh, his works are not restricted to this philosophical area, and he has written on a wide range of authors, uh, including Marx, Lukács, Heidegger, Habermas, and on the 15th century uh, philosophy in general. His production is uh, impressive, and among his contributions of Hegel, let me mention his book of 1986, uh, Hegel's Secret of Epistemology, which had uh, a great influence uh, on the following interpretations uh, of uh, Hegel's epistemology, but also Cognition of 1997, Before and After Hegel, Hegel Idealism and Analytic Philosophy. He also published books and essays on Kant, uh, like Kant Phenomenology, Kant and Idealism, and he edited collected volumes and wrote essays on Fichte. Uh, some of the collected volumes are Fichte, a Vocation of Man, Fichte and Phenomenological Tradition, Fichte, German Idealism and Early Romanticism. Uh, Professor Rockmore has already addressed his attention to the reading of Kant and Hegel developed by John McDowell. And today is going to give a talk on this topic entitled Truth, Truth in Philosophy Means That the Concept Corresponds to Reality. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. This morning, John McDowell gave us an excellent uh, close reading of several passages from the uh, introduction to the phenomenology. I was going to say uh, some things which are more general. Uh, my intention, I think that there are different ways to read Hegel and uh, German idealism. My intention is to sketch uh, an outline a some uh, some parts of a, of, a, of a different kind of reading. And what I'm interested in is is what I call constructivism. And I think that there, my overall argument is that I think that that, that John's approach to Hegel concerns a certain way of reading Kant. And I want to say that there are really two views in Kant. Uh, I wanted to say, argue for two different views. And I want to say that John chooses one and that uh, Hegel chooses another. This paper will consider uh, John McDowell's reading of Kant and Hegel through his reaction to Allison's reading of Kant. I will be suggesting McDowell's claim that the real shows itself, uh, commits himself, as it for instance committed Heidegger, Turning away from Kant's constructivism is most important insight. Kant is obviously one of the uh, very few key modern figures. In a sense, with respect to Kant, there is a before and after. Many later figures, including Hegel and McDowell, react indirectly or even directly to Kant. McDowell's claim that the real shows itself, commits himself commits him as a committed Heidegger and others uh, to an anti or at least non-constructivist reading of the critical philosophy. Since McDowell's reading of Hegel depends on his reading of Kant, it will be useful to concentrate on the latter. And since his reading of Kant apparently depends on his reaction to Allison's interpretation of Kant, I will uh, focus on that particular approach in his writings. So, uh, this is very narrow, but I'm trying then to, uh, to track what uh, uh, McDowell says about Allison because I think it's key to his reading of Kant and then that's key for his reading of Hegel. I should indicate at the outset that my interest is less to describe the views of McDowell, Kant, and Hegel, though it includes that task as well, than to determine what they contribute to our views of knowledge or following Kantian terminology Uh, cognitive 
uh, cognition. I hope to show that Kant, whose position is ambiguous, advances two incompatible views of cognition, and that McDowell defends the one that Kant later wisely rejects, but that Hegel defends the one Kant later put forward and that we should now also be defending. Hegel's interpretation of Kant initially depends on his reading of the debate from Kant through the post-Kantians, and later depends on taking into account the entire Western tradition. McDowell's view of Kant is arrived at mainly through his reading of a series of contemporary figures, including Strawson, Sellers, Allison, Pippin, perhaps Wittgenstein, as well as others. He curiously remarks that Strawson, whom he thinks is more Hegel than Kant, is close to what Kant wanted to achieve, though he's not sure that Kant's, that Strawson's Kant is Kant. I come back to Strawson's Kant below. For present purposes, it will, it will be sufficient to rely on McDowell's reaction in several places to Allison's Kant interpretation. McDowell discusses it in similar terms in a number of places, including Mind and World, in Having the World in View, and perhaps elsewhere as well. Through his reaction to Allison, McDowell formulates interpretations of Kant and then Hegel. According to McDowell, in Kant's Transcendental Idealism, Allison defends Transcendental Idealism as the only alternative to psychologistic phenomenalism. For present purposes, I will take psychologistic uh, nominalism as the view often attributed to Barclay. It should be uh, phenomenalism as the view often attributed to Barclay, according to which physical objects are really psychological phenomena. Observers sometimes also link this view to subjective idealism, to Hume, and so on. Allison draws attention to a distinction between the conditions of the possibility of knowledge of things and the conditions of the possibility of the things themselves. He regards his discussion as pointing to the so-called standard picture. McDowell rejects this approach and rejects the standard picture for two reasons. First, it appears to find a psychologistic phenomenalism in both Strawson's Kant and Kant, whereas McDowell finds it in neither. And second, it supposedly makes unintelligible the responses of Fichte and Hegel to Kant. I agree that Allison's distinction is problematic, but perhaps not for the same reasons as McDowell. It is problematic to distinguish between the conditions of the possibility of knowledge of things and the conditions of the possibility of things in themselves. If it is not possible to show there is no more than a single possibility for knowledge, a transcendental analysis of knowledge was fit. It is probably correct that Kant never doubts the existence of material things. That is in part the point of the refutation of idealism in which Kant answers Descartes and, Bar and Barclay, whom he thinks doubt the existence of the external world. Yet I think Kant's repeated uh, claims and efforts to show things in themselves must exist fail. McDowell denies that Strawson is a psychological nominalist. This denial could be interpreted in different ways. McDowell might be suggesting that Strawson, in avoiding psychological nominalism, also defends transcendental idealism. Yet that cannot be right, since in the bounds of sense, uh, Strawson reads the critical philosophy without transcendental idealism, which he regards, Strawson's words, as a deep mistake. McDowell uses Allison as a kind of stalking horse to formulate his reading of Kant. He rejects Allison's distinction, which he sees as dependent on transcendental realism, 
he looks favorably on what he calls Fichian and Hegelian responses to Kant, and later on the Hegelian alternative, or the view that the relevant conditions relate to thought as well as to objects. I agree that Fichte's reaction to Kant is important. Uh, Fichte transforms Kant's a priori analysis of the conditions of knowledge in general for an abstract subject into an anthropological account of the real conditions of knowledge for a finite human subject. Fichte is important in himself and for his influence on Hegel. The latter is arguably more strongly influenced by Fichte than, say, Schelling. Since I am, uh, I am uh, not aware that McDowell ever discusses Fichte in detail, I leave that uh, to one side. In Having the World in View, McDowell comes back to Allison in a passage on Seller's distinction between the scientific image and the manifest image. He cites Sellers in pointing out that, from a Kantian perspective, scientific images are constructions that do not really exist. Sellers has in mind Kantian constructivism on the scientific, but presumably not on the non-scientific everyday plane. My own view is that for Kant, everything we experience, including the, including the contents of the so-called folk view, is constructed in some way. McDowell, however, is interested in another point. McDowell suggests that Sellers gets Kant wrong, since he does not see that, the, that things in themselves that matter, that matter for his thinking about empirical knowledge are the very same things that make their, their appearance in intuition. In a footnote, McDowell goes on to say he is now correcting the two worlds picture of Kant he presupposed in mind and world, and that is everywhere in Alice's, in Alice's Kant book. McDowell justifies his view that reality appears in writing, quote, that note that what Kant insists on in B, uh, Roman numeral uh, 27, is an identity of things as they appear in our knowledge and the same things as things in themselves. McDowell goes on to note that he is not assuming that things in themselves have properties other than those that appear. He seems to be attributing to Kant the view that reality appears. There are a number of passages in which Kant clearly indicates that the mind independent external world not only exists, but is also given an experience. This is experience in, a, in an informal, popular way of using the term, not in Kant's other technical sense. According to this view, cognition immediately relates to objects which are given as representations and sensibility. Thus, in an important footnote, in reference to the validation of the propositions of reason, he suggests the cognitive object can be considered from two perspectives, as both an appearance and a thing in itself. In reference to the distinction between rain and a rainbow, Kant refers to the former as the thing in itself and the latter as its appearance. And in the refutation of idealism, he claims to know we are affected by a mind-independent external world. Kant's suggestion is related to the so-called double aspect thesis. This is a form of representation which some uh, Kant scholars, for instance, Feininger and uh, Dieks, uh, defend if necessary even against Kant. This defense is contradicted in the text. Thus Kant points out immediately before invoking the, Co the Copernican turn that there has never been progress in his words in assuming that our cognition must conform to the objects. The reason is that it's not possible, as Plato already points out, to argue on causal grounds from the effect 
the cause. So I, this is what I think is I call a reverse of atomic influence. Hence, any attempt to demonstrate this claim must fail. McDowell, who is committed to a view in which representations are representations of objects, stresses a strong realist approach. He remarks that the effect of his philosophy is to slight the independence of reality to which our senses give us access. Yet it is unclear that this is the correct way to read the critical philosophy or that such a position can be defended. The evidence for the correct interpretation is inconclusive since Kant's discussion of this problem is inconsistent. He argues both for and against the view that appearances and things are two sides of the same thing. Thus, in the passage on transcendental idealism, he writes in part that all appearances are not things, but rather nothing but representations, and they cannot exist at all outside the mind. The effect is to unlink representation from what supposedly appears. In the B preface, he insists that we have no concepts of the understanding and hence no elements for the recognition of things except insofar as an intuition can be given corresponding to these concepts. Yet we can only think but cannot show we are affected by reality. In a later passage, he draws attention to the distinction between causality on the level of appearances and on the level of reality. Quote, such an intelligible cause, however, will not be determined in its causality by appearance, even though its affects appear and so can be determined through other appearances. McDowell comes back to his reading of Kant and Hegel through Allison in having the world in view. In an article on the logical form of an intuition, he again objects that Sellers overlooks the Kantian point that what appears and what and what is are the same. McDowell returns to Allison's Kant interpretation in a footnote in a paper on Hegel's idealism as radicalization of Kant. As in mind and world, he again notes Allison's distinction in adding that in it the Hegelian alternative disappears. At stake is the suggestion that Allison identifies conditions that apply to thought of objects and objects and not primarily either the one or the other. McDowell thinks the same point, excuse me, McDowell makes the same point again in nearly identical language in a paper on the apperceptive eye and the empirical self. In the note to Allison in mind and world, McDowell objects that Allison's distinction cannot make sense of Fichte's and Hegel's reactions to Kant. This footnote differs in that McDowell now points only to the so-called alternative, since for Hegel, not for Kant, the relevant conditions are inseparably both conditions on thought and conditions on objects, not primarily either the one or the other. I infer that McDowell is attempting to differentiate between Kant and Hegel to the conditions as well as the limits of knowledge. An approach to knowledge through its necessary conditions is obviously central to Hegel. Yet Hegel seems to disregard identifying necessary conditions in several ways, including the idea that the proper way to begin is to begin, the refusal to isolate method from content, or the rejection of a wholly theoretical approach as isolated from practice and so on. McDowell distinguishes between Kantian and Hegelian views of the limits of knowledge. He says, quote, if we abstract from the role of the supersensible in Kant's thinking, 
we are left with a picture in which reality is not located outside such a boundary, uh, excuse me, outside a boundary that encloses the, con the conceptual. What I have been urging here is that such a picture does not slight the independence of reality. He further says, quote, it is central to absolute idealism to reject the idea that, that the conceptual realm has an outer boundary. I infer this means there is nothing outside what is given in experience which has no limits as to what can be conceptualized. On McDowell's account, but not on Seller's account, again, the reason is constrained from the outside. According to McDowell, Sellers incorrectly sees Hegel as abandoning objectivity. The latter point seems correct to me. Hegel does not reject, but rather rethinks objectivity or ob uh, objective cognition. There are numerous different views of objectivity. Here are three possibilities. First, there is the familiar claim, often called metaphysical or even platonic realism, to know the mind in the independent world as it is. This view is exemplified in ancient Platonism in which through intellectual intuition, some selected individuals have direct grasp of reality and in the modern foundationalist approach in claiming to infer from the contents of the mind to the real. A second possibility is the deduction of the a priori conditions of knowledge in general, as in the critical philosophy. Still, a third possibility is the description of the real conditions of knowledge, not in theory, but in practice. It is in that sense that Hegel holds there are relevant but inseparable conditions that hold for both the subject and the object of knowledge. The reason is that for Hegel, as McDowell points out, at the limit, subject and object are inseparable. What I think uh, McDowell misses is twofold. First, there is a sense in which for Kant, subjectivity is not intuitionally or indeed in, in any other way in touch with objective reality and, and able to make judgments about it. And second, there is the constructivist side of Kant, Hegel, and, the more, and more generally German idealism. McDowell is led astray in this respect by Kant himself when he talks about objects proceeding, proceeding themselves, excuse me, objects presenting themselves to our senses, as well as by recent commentators whose, view of ide whose views of idealism are often vague, general, non-specific, not very helpful. Now I'm going to, I'm going to say uh, a few things about having said that I think that people say uh, general, non-specific non things about ideals, and I'm going to say something about what I think it is. I turn now very rapidly to German idealism. There is confusion about idealism, hence about German idealism. In perhaps the earliest reference to idealism as a philosophical doctrine, Leibniz suggests that idealism and materialism are incompatible doctrines which could be synthesized in a single position. Later thinkers, including Barclay, Fichte, and the Marxist, think they are incompatible. The meaning of idealism varies widely. Fichte thinks it refers to a causal approach to knowledge. Thus Engels and most Marxists believe it means to go from theory to the world instead of conversely. Moore, who seems to have Barclay in mind, notoriously believes idealists of all stripes deny the existence of the external world. Berniet presents a version of Moore's view that ideal, idealism denies the existence of the external world in which Barclay is the main villain. Uh, Russell holds a similar view. The span of interpretations of idealism has arguably never been greater. 
Schwarzschild is not an about, about the defense of reading of the critical philosophy without idealism, which he regards as indefensible. Franks holds that, that Reinhold, an epistemological foundationalist and a post-Kantian thinker, is the first idealist. According to Pippin, idealism means, quote, the unity of our perception is possible only if empirical concepts apply to the objects of, excuse me, if non-empirical concepts apply to the objects of experience. This suggestion seems to describe Kant, but not say either Fichte or Hegel. In part, the difficulty in understanding idealism, hence German idealism, is due to Kant, who is justly read in different, often incompatible ways. The sympathetic to me. The incompatible reading of the critical philosophy seems to reflect an inconsistent position, perhaps because Kant has trouble making up his mind. It seems reasonable to regard idealism, hence Kantian idealism, as an alternative to representationalism or a cognitive approach to representation. In the famous Hertz, Re Hertz letter, written early in the critical period, he describes a project centering on what grounds the reference of what in us is called representation to the subject. This implies his position is based on a theory of cognitive representation. Yet in the B preface in the first critique, he advances an anti-representationalist constructivist approach to, in suggesting that we cannot know reality or a mind independent object, but can only recognize what we in some sense construct. The two approaches are apparently incompatible. So now I've claimed that what I mean by idealism is constructivism, cognitive constructivism, and now <coughs> I want to claim that Kant has two approaches simultaneously. A representational approach seems to imply that, as Kant writes, cognitions must conform to objects it represents. This is the basis of strong forms of realism, sometimes called metaphysical realism, which take as the cognitive criteria knowledge of the mind-independent world as it is, in fact, is beyond appearance. In metaphysical realism, epistemological claims presuppose a strong ontological criteria. This view goes all the way back in the tradition until at least Parmenides. His, his famous claim in writing Tokar Auto Noin points toward what later becomes metaphysical realism in opting for identity as the standard of knowledge. This interpretation is, is supported by textual analysis. The Spurniant, who thinks idealism is a, is a specifically modern doctrine, believes that Parmenides holds that thought refers to being. The influential Parmenidean approach uh, to knowledge echoes through the tradition. There are still many observers uh, committed to metaphysical realism. Hence, at least distantly committed, excuse me, hence, at least distantly committed to a Parmenidean criterion for, for cognition. A Parmenidean solution to the cognitive problem would be a successful claim for the unity of thought and being, where the latter refers to the mind independent external world. A version of, that, of this approach is, is influentially accepted by Plato. He either relies on intellectual intuition to, to support the claim that there is knowledge of reality, or thinks that if this criterion could be met, there would be knowledge of reality. Platonism apparently influences Kant negatively. In rejecting intellectual intuition, Kant turns away from the Parmenidean approach but not from the related Parmenidean view of the identity of thought and being. Kant seems to deny any form of the view that knowledge requires grasping reality in pointing out that no one has ever shown 
how to grasp the mind independent world. He can be understood in this respect as supporting Plato's denial of a backward inference from effect to cause, from appearance to reality. A representationalist reading of Kant sees the critical philosophy as continuing and developing a favored modern approach. A constructivist reading of Kant sees the critical philosophy as not continuing, but rather as breaking with modern representationalism of all kinds. Though I cannot argue the point here, a constructivist reading of the critical philosophy is presupposed, is helpful in several ways. First, it suggests German idealism does not begin after Kant, for instance in Reinhold, since Kant is already an idealist. Second, German idealism uh, turns on finding a way to defend cognitive constructivism. The German idealist movement as a whole can be understood as an ongoing effort by different hands to formulate an acceptable version of constructivism. Third, according to this criterion, through it, uh, though influential on, on German idealism, uh, Schelling would not be a German idealist, but Marx, who supports constructivism, would belong to the German idealist tradition. For present purposes, constructivism uh, can be understood as a thesis that when we know the empirical object, what we know is a construction according to the form providing mechanisms of our cognitive faculties. A number of, fac of factors favor a constructivist reading of Kant. They include the fact that Kant thinks representationalism and constructivism are exclusive alternatives. Second, about the same time, Kant was pointing to representation, representation in the Hertz letter. He was delivering lectures on logic in which he claimed that the meaning of representation cannot be defined. So I hold that Kant then is committed to a view which he thought officially couldn't be, couldn't be uh, defined. Then there is the fact that Kant was already understood as a constructivist in his own lifetime. for instance, by Schelling and Reinhold. Further, Kant's refutation of idealism rejects views of ideal some views of idealism, but not idealism in general. In the different shift, Hegel adopts an interpretation of Kant, which he later deepens and develops, but does not basically alter. Here and in later writings, Hegel identifies cognitive constructivism as central to the critical philosophy. He refers to constructivism in different but related ways as speculation, as in principle authentic idealism, and as the identity of subject and object. I infer from these very brief remarks three things. First, according to Hegel, Kant is an idealist, dare we say, a German idealist. Second, Hegel's accounts of Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Reinhold suggests German idealism unfolds as related forms of cognitive constructivism. And third, it is clear in this and other texts, especially the Encyclopedia Logic, that Hegel also favors cognitive constructivism, though obviously not in its Kantian formulation. For instance, in the remarks on the attitude of thought to of thought to ob objectivity, Hegel presents a progression from prior metaphysics through empiricism, which includes Kant and intuition leading up to his own constructivist position. Hegel's constructivist approach to cognition can be illustrated by the introduction to the phenomenology. Hegel here, here sketches a widely familiar, experientially based cognitive method following from his re revision of ancient Greek dialectic. According to the Hegelian model, cognition unfolds as a process in which a view or theory consisting of one or more concepts is formulated on the basis of experience and then tested through further experience. 
The test has two and only two possible outcomes. One possibility is that since subject and object are not identical, the theory uh, fails the test of experience. Hence must be modified. The other possibility is that for at least the present moment, the theory survives the test of experience, including the experiential identity of thought and being, knower and known, theory and object. <coughs> the Hegelian constructivist approach to cognition resembles many views of knowledge from experience. It differs in the view that the cognitive object, namely what we seek to know, is a function of, or perhaps better dependent on the theory about it. Hegel thinks that when the theory is modified, its object also changes. He disagrees in this way uh, with, with Putnam, who in his internal realist phase described the phenomenological process as, as adapt, excuse me, the epistemological process as adapting the theory to the way the world is and always remains. Hegel's view that the object changes in the cognitive process anticipates uh, Peirce's famous view of the long run in the course of which we come to adopt a view of the world as given an experience. This cognitive model is widely utilized, for instance, in modern science, which turns on, the, on constructing an appropriate model of what for purposes of cognition we assume, and indeed must assume, in the mind-independent world, but which we, we do not and cannot know. As McDowell points out, Hegel relies on an external constraint. Yet he does not claim to know or otherwise cognize the world as it is. That is, other than as what is given in experience. On the contrary, Hegel agrees with Kant that there is no possible cognition of mind-independent reality. But Hegel differs from Kant in that he nowhere claims an account of knowledge depends on granting the existence of things in themselves or mind-independent reality. This is a place where McDowell and Brandon clearly disagree. Well, we saw that this morning. Uh, though McDowell thinks that, that for Hegel as for Kant, we know there are representations of reality. He does not claim, as Brandon seems to claim, that we in fact know the world. Brandon, who mysteriously claims his inferentialism builds on Hegel, rather seems to build on Davidson, who, in the course of arguing against, epistemal, uh, against conceptual schemes, claims that this will, uh, quote, reestablish unmediated touch with the familiar objects whose antics make our, our sentences and opinions true or false. Brandon picks up on this claim, which he restates as the view that we can co correctly infer about, say, electrons or aromatic compounds, compounds, hence know how things are with electrons and aromatic compounds, and just, and not just on what judgments and inferences we endorse. Yet Hegel, who restricts knowledge to experience, never claims to know what reality is. Perhaps because he is simultaneously defending different views, Kant is simply inconsistent. He says that reality appears, but he also denies that noumena act causally. This is what seems to follow from what he says about the thing in itself or reality. Yet his position is to say the least unclear in the, in the prolegomena, uh, paragraph 32, where he says clearly that, that noumena underlie phenomena. In paragraph 36, that our sensibility is affected by objects unknown to us, and so on. And, and again in paragraph 57, immediately after claiming it would be observed, absurd to hope to cognize the possible experience of an object, contends, quote, it would be an even greater absurdity for us to allow any things in themselves at all. Heidegger clearly favors this side of Kant in rejecting the 
the, la the latter's later interest in constructivism. In the origin of the work, or, a work of art, Heidegger is, is expounds the provocative aesthetic view that we authentically see ancient Greece through the picture of a Greek temple and the world of, of work through a peasant's shoes. Heidegger's aesthetic view depends on the claim there is a world, a real world, which on, on the proper occasion direct, is directly visible to the phenomenological gaze. Heidegger finds this Kantian view in the initial version of the first critique. Kant's claim goes beyond what he says in the first critique, where he indicates one can, without contradiction, think, think of the thing in itself as the intelligible cause. In the prolegomena, he clearly uh, He clearly claims that the, thing, that the thing in itself exists. The reason seems to be that, that if what is given in, in experience is an effect, it follows there must be a cause. Hence, the critical philosophy favors a form of causality that extends beyond the, the limits of experience. The argument can be informally uh, reconstructed as follows. Knowledge is by definition a priori. We can only have a priori cognition of possible experience for ourselves, but we cannot have experience of a thing in itself. Now, we cannot claim any cognition at all with respect to, to the thing in itself, since space, time, and the categories refer to possible experience only. Yet, it would be even more absurd to deny the experience of the thing in itself. Kant seems to be motivated by two reasons here. <coughs> First, to deny the existence of the thing in itself or reality is, like you, to take the limits of our, of our reason as the limits of reason in general. Or, in other words, to mistake the limits of our possible experience for the limits of things in themselves. Kant, who here makes room for observers different from finite human beings, adds that we cannot say anything determinate about things in themselves which lie beyond the boundaries of all possible experience. Second, he seems to want completeness in that if experience is caused, then it is an effect which in turn demands a cause. Yet the problem is not whether other beings might access reality in a different way than us, but whether we are entitled to an existence claim about reality. Neither are concerned with causal explanation of experience, nor the possibility that other beings might relate differently to reality, allows us to infer mind-independent reality exists. The difficulty which goes beyond the critical philosophy concerns the extent of cognition which Kant uh, takes here as a bound, but not as a limit. It is certainly plausible that there is a mind-independent world. <coughs> Yet no argument proves that we either know it as it is, or that there is reality. We can infer without contradiction that there is a mind-independent world in much the same way as we, as, as, as in order to think of the world as rational, we can, on deus grounds, invoke a higher form of rationality, though there is no reason, none at all, to think this is the case. I come now to my conclusion. McDowell approaches the main figures of German idealism through critical discussion of, of selected interpreters for Kant, Allison, and since he builds on his reading of Allison to interpret Hegel, Hegel as well. This paper has examined McDowell's views of both Kant and Hegel through his critical reading of Allison's view of Kant. Allison distinguishes between readings of the critical philosophy as psychological phenomenalism, which he rejects, or transcendental idealism, which he accepts. McDowell rejects both readings, hence the exclusive alternative for a third view. 
This third view, which supposedly anticipates the Hegelian alternative, is related to a form of direct realism. One way to put the point is to say that McDowell apparently finds in Hegel the kind of realist view he holds and thinks we should be holding when he is not interpreting German idealism. In response, I have suggested Kant's view is systematically ambiguous and further identified two readings of the critical philosophy suggested by the text. I have finally argued that McDowell defends the form of the view that Kant initially defends but later directly rejects, and Hegel defends a version of the, of the view Kant eventually accepts. McDowell ascribes a representational approach to knowledge in both Kant and Hegel. This, is, this ascription is doubly problematic. Kant, who began as a representationalist, later turns to constructivism. He points out, as noted above, that no one has ever shown, and as we can, can add, no one has still ever shown, how to cognize the mind independent of external world. I believe that, as Fichte points out, mind independent reality is no, is no more than a mere posit. It is then an error either to attribute a representation, a representational approach to Kant without qualification or to defend the strategy which is not, which is not more promising now than in Kant's time. On the other hand, a reading of either Kant or Hegel as a representational thinker overlooks what is genuinely exciting and, and new about them, that is their commitment to formulating an acceptable constructivist approach to composition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just self-defense. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot there. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to formulate a question, but I'll, um, I'll make a comment, and then you can comment on my comment. And that's you know, instead of a question, demanding an answer. Um, I, I think this gets at where you are at the conclusion, but um, somewhere in the middle of the paper, uh, you had the two things that I miss. Uh, about Kant. Um, if I'm getting it right, one, uh, for Kant, um, subjectivity is not in touch with objective reality. Uh, and two, uh, Kant is a constructivist. And if, if, if I understand it, that's really two ways of making the same today. Um, uh, what you want to say is, for Kant, correctly understood as not by me. Um, uh, subjectivity is in touch only with uh, what it constructs and that's other than uh, <laughs> objective reality. So um, constructivism is a way of um, putting in place a denial that subjectivity is in touch with objective reality. Um, so okay, um, um, my inclination is to say uh, although there are no doubt strands in Kant that point in that direction as when he um, allows himself to be um, distracted by uh, certain ambiguities in German uh, into <laughs> saying things like um, uh, um, phenomenal objects are, are only representations. Um, in Kant it is best. Uh, we are too in touch with uh, reality that's objective in a perfectly good sense. Um, the, 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 the right way to formulate um, a basic Kantian thought, um, the one that you uh, think simply fixes it, that he's a constructivist, the right way to formulate that thought is by saying something like, uh, we are in touch with the real only as the real conforms to the requirements for us to be in touch with it. <laughs> and, you know, how could that be wrong? Um, uh, um, uh, things in themselves are um, denizens of the real, um, abstracted from 
their uh, being such as to conform to our requirements for being in touch with them. So sure, obviously, we're not in touch with the real, as it were, in that guise, right? But we are in touch with the real in the guise of the real, so far as it conforms to uh, our requirements for being in touch with it. And now, um, there's an issue about what to mean by mind independence. Uh, I, I, if I'm understanding you, your line is, um, look, that fixes it, that this that we are, according to Kant, in touch with, cannot be mind independent reality. Um, but that presupposes an answer to a question that I think is still open. If we say as much as I've said, um, namely, is the conformity on the part of some object to our requirements for being in touch with it a creature of our minds or not? And you can say, no, it's not a creature of our minds. Um, it, it's mind independently true that uh, the objects that we are in touch with um, uh, are formally such as to, for it, such a, as to enable us to be in touch with them. So, so um, that, that, that's idealism. Uh, um, we, we, we can't uh, get in touch with anything except insofar as it conforms to the requirements for our being in touch with it. That's idealism and it isn't constructivism. Okay, well that was a, a, a comment. I'm sort of not buying into your suggestion. I'm all wrong because the constructivist strand in Kant is uh, the right one. I, I agree that he's ambiguous. Uh, there are uh, rhetorical moves in Kant that sound constructivist, but I think that's the bad strand. Kant at his best <laughs> is, is um, uh, um, not constructivist. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I didn't expect that I would persuade you. <laughs> I was trying to uh, point to a different way to read it. Now, uh, I think you're right that, in part, if you can see that there there's a genuine ambiguity, then the problem would be how to read Kant. Now, I, I would say that both readings are correct because Kant is committed to both of them. But I think that they're antithetical. Uh, I mean, you could say that what we mean by reality is not the mind independent world that we seek to know, but it's rather the reality that we ourselves construct. But I think that Kant has got to be, con uh, I think he has uh, two different views, and I think he's defending them simultaneously. Now, the, the one that I call the first view, the representationalist view, is historically the first view that he defends. And if, uh, if Kant is a representationalist in this sense, then he would be the latest in a long line of modern representationalists and maybe the, the high point of representationalism. Now, I think that one, we can't make out a representational approach, and two, uh, Kant himself indicates he's aware of an alternative and, and turns to it. Now, if, if ideal, uh, you want to say that idealism means that we're aware of that of which we can meet the conditions of being aware of these things. But I want to say that Kant is committed to more than that, so that, I mean, if uh, possibly we could be, a, if there were a, re a mind independent real world, and if we could show that on Tuesdays we were, we were aware of it, that then Kant could then be, that would be what ideals would be. But I think that Kant is saying something different. Now, I think that there's a genuine ambiguity in Kant. And I think that one way you could parse it is to say, well, there's a world outside us and it affects us through sensation, but sensations are, are already representations. Now, he says that. There are many passages. But you could also parse it and say, well, 
there are sensations which come in which are not sensations of an object, but out of which objects are constructed. Now, I think they're different views. And I, uh, I think it's fine to take the first view. I, I personally think that the other one is, is more productive. Now, I think uh, that the view is a, a extremely widespread, but I think it's, it's the kind of thing that the German idealists thought they were doing. But I think that now the discussion it has, uh, for various reasons, seems to think that that they're doing something else and they should be doing something else. So I respect the, the, the different views and I respectfully disagree. John? Uh, yes, thank you, John. Um, I guess I too really have comments rather than a, a question, although obviously you can come up with a comment. Um, and they kind of amount, I'm afraid, to sort of disagreeing with you on both Kant and, and, and Hegel, but I thought for the purposes of the event, I could put that to you and see how you respond. Um, I would say with regard to Kant, that is no ambiguity in Kant at all. He's perfectly clear about what he's saying. Um, we start with the experiences that we have, the world, uh, the objects of experience. We reflect on the conditions that make that possible, and we discover that some of those are subjective, namely the forms of space and time. As a consequence of that, then the objects of experience are termed appearances. Now, the thought of the thing in itself is simply, in when to use Fichte's term, the kind of posit that thought must set in order to make sense of the fact that the objects that we relate to are appearances. And I'll give a quotation tomorrow where, where Kant says that ex explicitly, that thought makes for itself the concept of an object as it is for itself. I don't think Kant anywhere, meaning it, <laughs> claims that things in themselves exist. You can't, he doesn't, he's not allowed to make that kind of, this is very interesting. He doesn't make that kind of claim. And he doesn't say that things in themselves are as well, the, ob the object of reality. They, uh, the thought of the thing in itself is the thought of the object of experience as it were, abstracted from the conditions under which we know it, except, of course, in the case of the soul and God and so on. And it seems to me now that if there are phrases in which said, Kant says something different, then we interpret that in, in what I take to be the spirit of what he's saying. So now this doesn't run against your idea that, that Kant could be a constructivist with respect to appearances, but it means that appearances, as it were, aren't contrasted with some putative reality in itself. So, Obviously, I'd like you afterwards then to maybe respond to that. With Hegel, it seems to me that things are different, in that Hegel clearly, although I think he does have constructivist elements, which I'll again refer to, he clearly does want to make the claim that thinking thinks being. Of course, for Kant, it doesn't. Thinking brings to mind possibility for Kant, not, not being. And so again, it seems to me that your emphasis on the constructivism, which I think has much merit, maybe pushes the point too far because your Hegel loses touch with being, and your Kant, as it were, thinks that he's not in touch with a being, which on my view, he never thought we would be in touch with anyway, because things in themselves, that concept is, is an explicit posit by thought in order to make sense of the limits of sensibility. So that's my view that, that the constructivism maybe perhaps is allied with, with extra thoughts in both Kant and Hegel on your view that it doesn't need to be allied with. I'm not, I'm not clear what you mean by uh, ally. Uh, but You're adding thought to the notion of constructivism. Well, but I mean, in neither case, I think, are well, really... Well, I, mean, I mean, in part, this could be uh, uh, settled by looking at the text, because you say that I'm, I'm attributing to Kant the view that he doesn't hold. Uh, I, I don't have the proto governor with me, but I can show you passages where he says that it would be absurd to deny the existence of things in themselves, as they exist. Uh, now, if if your objection is on that level, then I think I think I can show you the passages. Now, maybe you can show me that he doesn't mean it. Uh, now, uh, clearly, clearly Hegel discusses being. He refers to being. I think the problem. The problem isn't 
whether he discusses with B, but what he means when he says it, he refers to B. And I think that, that that's where the action is. Now, um, what I want to say is that there are really two kinds of ways of, or, or I have then a, something on the back burner here. I think that there are, there are two kinds of ways of going about the problem of knowledge. One is to, is to know the mind-independent world, and I think that that's what representationalism is about. No, I think that Kant is, is systematically ambiguous in his, in his use of the word appearance and representation. Uh, that's one point. The other, the other point, uh, you know, I don't have enough, quite enough light. It's hard for me to see. The, uh, the other, you, it's, I, I, I missed the point uh, about uh, your second point. I, I wrote something, but I can't read it. So, well, I, sorry, just to repeat, well, I suppose I, my thought was that in both cases, you attribute a constructivism to Kant and to yeah, sure. which seems to have, to my point of view, a strong grain of truth to it. Right. But in the case of Hegel, right. I think what's missing your account is the fact that Hegel thinks that through the activity of thought we can bring to mind being. And so constructivism in that sense does not leave us short of anything. In the case of Kant where you seem to be suggesting that his constructivism does leave him short of something. My understanding there is that what Kant's argument is that an imminent one, that from within the perspective of experience, we understand experience to be governed by subjective conditions and therefore to be the experience of appearances. And thought must posit, therefore, the concept of the thing in itself as limit to what we can know, as cause of our sensations, and maybe possibly even as existing. But that is for Kant never more than a thought that we must, and so in that sense, it seems to me, you have Kant's constructivism for you falling short of a reality, whereas I would want to say, no, there is, the only thing that the Kantian appearance falls short of is what we have thought to be its limit. Whereas in the case of Hegel, I think there is a connection to being for Hegel, again, that we don't fall short of because he thinks our activity brings into contact with us, that brings us into contact with us. Well, I, 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 you and I agree about Hegel in a way, and that I want to, I want to say that for Hegel to know is to, is to, is to have a, a, an identity. But I think yeah. I mean, that's what the identity theory is. So, that, so that here my, my point about Parmenides is that there, are, there's a view about a claim, claim to know, mind-independent reality as it is. And that's what I call metaphysical realism. That echoes through the discussion. It's very popular today under different names. But then there's a view that uh, that what we what we know that the subjective side and the objective side come together, and they come together. Uh, either they come together, or the theory must be in some way be modified. But the modification of the theory is a modification of the object. Now, I think that that's what Hegel's doing. Now, that part of the problem is what constructivism means. And it seems to me it means different things to different people. But what I want to say is that there's a kind of project, an ongoing project that Kant sets it, that, that comes into the modern tradition from ancient mathematics. And it, it's in Hobbes and Vico and then, and then independently in Kant. And I think Kant influences the post-Kantians who are, who are all working in some way with, it, with this view. And it seems to me it's elsewhere as well. I think it's in, in certain strains of pragmatism. I think it's in Peirce. I think it's in Peirce's idea of the long run, which I think is genuinely Hegelian. So I'm, I'm not clear that we're, we're that far apart. The okay, further questions? Teresa. Thank you, Tom, for a talk, very interesting. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, my comment is in the same way of the others, uh, that 
uh, I, I'd like to defend the coherence of Kant's thought. And I think that uh, your Kant is different from mine. <laughs> and I think that the point, and uh, I'd like to, to point out, is the, the just the, is the Edson's interpretation of, of first critique that uh, if you, what do you mean by the, the, the when, when you 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 think about, about this mind independent world? You for me it, it seems for me that you 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 identify the mind independent world with the world of the things in themselves. And for me, that's the problem. When you put, who, when you identify the mind independent world with the world of the things in themselves. And if you do that, it's Kant is completely incoherent because you, you have to take this position that the, the world of the things in themselves affect us and produce affect us in some, in some, in some, in some way. And if, and I think that it's a, there is a very, very important difference uh, that Kant makes in the, in the first critique between the, um, the transcendental realism and empirical realism. And in Edison's interpretation, there is not two words the world of the things in themselves and the world of the phenomena. There's only one world. And two, uh, two, way, two ways to think about this world. One way to, to think about this world is to think this world as it, if it is in itself. But it, it is incoher incoherent if you, if you take this position. Because the only way to access this world is the way this world affects us and uh, with our capacities to, to understand this world. And I think that it's our difference between our lectures, our readings from God. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, I hear I hear in the background the claim about the nature of natural science. Uh, you're, you think it's uh, implausible to attribute to Kant the view where things in themselves mean the mind independent world. Uh, and, and it's incoherent to think that the world as it is in itself affects us. But clearly, that's one major meaning of Kant. Uh, I myself think that Kant holds the view that we cannot we cannot claim to know the world as it is in itself. Uh, I don't see the the concept of the thing in itself is interpreted in many different ways in the German tradition. The two main ways seem to be as an as a uh, an ontological claim or an epistemological limit. Now I don't know what the thing in itself could be other than a claim about reality. I think it I think it's kind of shorthand for a claim of the way the world uh, really is. Now uh, I think he's led to that by various reasons including the idea that if, uh, against you, he's reestablishing causality, if uh, representations are effects, then there must be a cause. Now, since uh, representations cannot be self-caused, there must be an external cause. And that's why I think he needs the existence of the thing in itself. Now, I think that that goes beyond that goes beyond uh, many other passages where he, where he seems to claim that the thing, that things in themselves, the thing in itself, can be understood as a, uh, without contradiction, as a, an ideal limit. That's a different kind of view. Now, um, Allison, what I, what I uh, find puzzling about Allison, uh, I don't think that. Uh, 
John is, is talking about this, is the so-called double aspect view. The double aspect view is the claim that, for instance, if you see uh, a, a cup, the appearance of the cup and the cup itself are two aspects of the same thing. Now, there there are admittedly passages in Kant where Kant says that, but uh, I th I think that that's an incoherent view. I don't think you can you can't show that what what we experience and what is are the same thing. Well, sort of, I think is committed to some version of this view, but I think it's incoherent. Okay, maybe we have still time for one last question. Yep. Um, actually, I'm just trying to figure out uh, the, uh, how a uh, extreme constructivist approach uh, cuts off the possibility of thinking about a mind-independent reality. And uh, I, I'm not thinking of Kant. Uh, I don't know how many Kants there are. I, I don't have a, a Kant. But I'm thinking of the, the Kantian tradition. For example, you mentioned Sellers. And uh, Sellers says that, for example, this scientific image, it's a, a, a construction. But it's at the same time true and uh, real. And uh, it will overcome our manifest image of reality. And, uh, and it seems that to be true or real is uh, the same thing as more uh, uh, closer to to the reality. So uh, I think we, we cannot just uh, finish with this concept. It's a kind of we need to, to to have the concept of an independent reality to think of the very possibility of cons constructing something, constructing an image or a, a, a conceptual scheme or whatever. So. Uh, uh, I can't figure out how how these extreme constructivist approach just um, cuts off uh, the, the possibility of um, mind independent reality. I don't want to say that it cuts off any possibility. Uh, what I want to say is that mind independent reality needn't come into play. Uh, it seems to me that if, if, if your cognitive claim is, is a claim of knowing the world in itself or the way the world really is, then there's a problem. Now, I think in, in natural science, uh, one, has to, one has to assume that we're discovering something out there, but that's a puzzle. We don't know that that's true. I think we can know that that's true. And I, I take Kant to be claiming in, in the so-called Copernican Revolution that no progress has ever been made towards that project. So. It's, there's a difference between what we can certifiably claim that we know and what we, what we might feel that we're constrained to assume in order to make sense of some, uh, uh, some approach uh, uh, to cognition. But to, say, but to say that we feel constrained to argue in this way doesn't mean it's true about the way the world really is. Now, uh, You mentioned Sellers' distinction between the scientific image and the, and the manifest image. And you say the scientific image is constructed. Well, yes, Sellers seems to say that. But so is the manifest image. It's all constructed. And the idea that we have uh, some kind of manifest image and that's not constructed and the scientific image is constructed, it's very problematic. Now, I think that really to say that the scientific image is constructed raises questions about what we mean by construction and how we bring that in touch with the world. Now, there's a certain John McDowell who argued long ago in a different century that Sellers' view really turns round on itself because it has no uh, anchor in, in the external world. So I, I don't think I, I, I think that one should be careful. I hear the hint of criticism that my view of constructivism is extreme. Well, maybe it needs to be tempered, but I count on you to tell me how to how to 
uh, formulate a bus, we'll be able to construct a bus. But really, connecting uh, sellers to it doesn't mean it's acceptable at all. Okay, uh, thank you to Professor Rockwell. Thank you.